All right, so uh, we're going to do something a little bit different today. I got the TV back up, and so um, there's going to be some slides we're going to work through. Uh, if at any point you need to move, I would say just do that. Be bold. Get up. Come closer. I tested it out a little bit. It's a little, co- it's a little, it's a little small at points, but uh, I think it's good. I could read it all the way at the back of the, at the, back of the building, and I'm pretty sure I need new glasses. So for whatever, whatever that's worth, I, th- I think we should be good. Um, But you may remember me reading for like 27 minutes up here, and then we got into the sermon last week. Um, Today, I've got even better news for you. Uh, We're doing two chapters, (laughs) four and six. And if I'd continued with the same logic, I would have said, listen, let's read all of it. Let's read four and let's read six. We're not going to do that because that would have taken up as much time as I am allowed for the sermon and, uh, you know, I'm already long enough as it is, so eh, nobody, nobody has enough, <laughs> nobody's like, looking at your watches already, like, come on here. Um, the reason I've got the TV up here is, uh, is because I, I still think it's important to get these verses in front of you, and we are going to work through uh, some passages in chapter 4 and in chapter 6. Um, And so the best way to do that, I thought, would be to do this, and uh, I think it's going to help us just kind of work through it. Uh, What you're going to see is, I hope, a pattern as we work through these uh, sort of three movements, okay? Uh, And uh, and so I hope that we start to see a little bit of a pattern uh, emerge and uh, and a concrete step for us. Um, But let me just say this as well, take this as an opportunity to say, uh, I would love it if by next week, uh, here's the challenge, read chapters four and six in its entirety. And if you get like extra, you know, energy or uh, read four, five, and six, because next week we're going backwards to five. Okay, we're going to hang out in chapter five <laughs> next week. Um, but uh, let's, let's, let's go. So, uh, when we left Nehemiah off last week, uh, he was building the wall, and uh, you may remember, you may have gotten caught up. If not, um, Nehemiah in our series called Rebuilding, where we're studying the book of Nehemiah, we've left Nehemiah, he's arrived in Jerusalem, he's rallied the troops, he said, hey, we got to rebuild, and then you remember chapter 3, where we read about every single person who put, you know, themselves to the work of rebuilding. They are rebuilding the wall. We're going to find out today that there's actually some level of success. There's some momentum here. The wall in these chapters reaches half its height in four, and then by chapter six, it's actually completed. So, you know, there's some success. They haven't just started the build. They're actually building toward uh, the goal, right? Toward what uh, they've been trying to accomplish. Like I said, I want us to pay attention to this back and forth, which really, I think, is going to be helpful. There's a proverb from uh, the Bible that's often quoted, and for good reason. It's quoted for good reason. There's a lot of wisdom in it. And maybe you've heard this proverb before. It uh, might have been in a church setting. It might have been in uh, an organization, like in a business setting. It does pop up from time to time. Um, Maybe in relationship to casting a vision for an organization. I think this proverb helps set us up today really well. The proverb is this. It's the first half of Proverb 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And that's in the King James Version, which I bet you didn't think I would be quoting from uh, good old King James on a Sunday morning. But the proverb is a good indication about where we are headed today. Uh, Because if I could add my own little hook to this proverb, it would be this, that equally as true is where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is a vision, the people tend to revolt. In other words, where there is a vision, where there is a strong indicator of saying, this is where we are going, this is where we are going to go together, there will be opposition. There will be pushback. So revolt is maybe a little bit too strong of a word, but where there is a vision, there will be opposition. And that's in the Grant Don't Quote Me version. That doesn't exist in the Bible. <laughs> But we've seen this, okay? We've got a hint of this last week. We got a hint of this opposition in chapter three. 
where maybe you remember that uh, in all of the list of people, not every single person was in favor of the build, right? There was a line that read that there were some who opposed the build. There were some who did not participate in it. Not strong opposition, but it does, again, point us in the direction that we are headed today. Not everybody likes the fact that Nehemiah arrives on the scene ready to rebuild. Not everybody likes the fact that Nehemiah arrives on the scene with the king's blessing ready to rebuild. And so in 4 and 6, and what we're going to see today is that there will come opposition. In our rebuilds, in the rebuild that Nehemiah is working through individually, personally, as a family, in a church setting, as a congregation, as an organization, like there will be opposition to seasons of rebuilding. Why? Because there is always somebody who thinks that rebuilding is the wrong thing to do. Take any relationship that is worth rebuilding right? Any relationship that is worth fighting for, there's always going to be somebody, that one person who says, don't do it. They're not worth it. They're not worth your time. When an organization decides to take a stand on a moral ground or an ethical ground, like we are going to make certain decisions because we believe it is the right thing to do, there's always going to be the one person who says, listen, we are not going to make as much money if we do that. We should cut some corners, Right? There's always going to be this opposition. And I got to tell you, when a church decides to build toward a future that reaches people outside its walls, there's always going to be somebody who says, that's not the way we've done it in the past. And so today I do. I want to lean into this idea of opposition. I want to talk about it. But more specifically, I want to talk about what it looks like. And I also want to suggest for us that in this back and forth that we're going to see, I do think there emerges the single greatest like practical step we can take when we face opposition, right? Because there are seasons where you will face opposition in your life. But I also want you to hear this, and this is where we're going to actually end toward the end of the message. There may also be seasons where we, every single one of us, risk becoming the opposition. And so equally as important, I want us to lean into those, what to do when there is opposition. So again, like I said, last week, Nehemiah building, and in chapter four, uh, this is what we find. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding, so again, remember, this is Nehemiah writing in sort of his own words, he became angry and was greatly incensed. Uh, Sanballat is the governor of Samaria. Think Samaritan. Um, He was in charge of this area and a group of people. And as we see all throughout Scripture, certainly in the New Testament, um, the people of Israel and the Samaritans do not get along. That dynamic exists already at this point when Nehemiah is rebuilding the wall. So governor of Samaria doesn't like the fact that Nehemiah arrives on the scene ready to rebuild. And so what does he do? He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said this, he said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? And then uh, Tobiah, somebody who was with him, uh, who's at his side, he said, what they uh, are rebuilding, even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stone. Because apparently that was an insult back in the day. <laughs> even a fox would destroy it. But I got to say, I'm not an engineer. And if a fox could take down the wall stand, like it's not a good look on that wall, how they're building. But uh, opposition begins immediately. What we see in chapter four is that, like, the, so the wall, like I've said, it's going to reach half its height, but they haven't reached it yet. Already in the early stages, there's opposition to the rebuild. There's opposition to what Nehemiah is doing and to what the Jewish people are doing in Jerusalem. And it's opposition that comes from outside. It's opposition that comes from the surrounding regions. It's opposition from those around the southern kingdom, around Jerusalem, who don't want the Israelites to succeed. And so what do they do? They become angry. They become insensitive. And then they ridicule. They get together and they ridicule the Jews for what they're doing. They ridicule. They make fun of Nehemiah for the rebuild. Look at their wall, they say, right? Even a fox climbing up on it would break it. You have faced ridicule in your life before. 
Maybe you've faced this kind of opposition where when you make a bold stand for something, people's response is to make fun of you. And the kind of the, the idea is let's ridicule this person, make fun of their idea. Let's try to convince them that it's not worth their energy, right? Let's make them feel so bad about who they are and what they're doing that they stop rebuilding, that they get discouraged. Nehemiah, we continue reading, says this, Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder uh, in a land of captivity. Nehemiah gets a little bit salty. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins for, you know, from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. I think it's, it's important to notice that the first thing that Nehemiah does when he faces opposition is he prays. The first move that Nehemiah makes is toward prayer. He doesn't turn his mind and his heart toward those who are opposing him. He turns his heart and his mind toward God. And I think that's an important move. What do we see happen? Um, It says, so we rebuilt the wall, all of it, right? Uh, Till all reached half its height for the people worked with all their heart. It does seem to, to indicate to us that when Nehemiah decides to pray, it kind of rallies the people. It reminds them of who is behind them, whose sort of direction and vision they are following. It reminds them of why they are doing what they're doing. And so they get back to work. Now, I do want to say this much. I'm probably uh, the first person to say that this is not my first reaction when I face opposition in the form of ridicule. And maybe you can relate more to me than to Nehemiah. I think it's safe to say that the human reaction, the default human reaction to ridicule is likely not prayer, but defensiveness. We respond in kind, right? There's opposition, we are ridiculed, there's pressure, and we feel it, and then we react based on those feelings, and we push back. We say, hey, you are pushing me, I am going to push you. It's natural, right? You feel attacked, what's the best defense? It is to just become uh, offensive. (laughs) It is to attack back, right? And so we push, and I think that the first thing that this passage does encourage us just to meditate on, and that's what I would like us to do in these three sort of uh, evolutions around or kind of back and forth, is to think about these things. Prayer guards against defensiveness. When there is opposition, prayer guards your heart against becoming defensive. And so there's opposition, It is ridicule. It has the potential to completely distract. And yet in prayer, Nehemiah says, okay, God, would you protect us from these insults? That's the first back and forth. We continue reading in 4-7. But when uh, Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble. Against Run the risk of facing anyways is this kind of direct threat opposition. And you can think about it like this. Step one, let's ridicule them. Let's hurl insults. Let's try to discourage them. And when that doesn't work, the next step, it progresses, right? It escalates to now let's threaten their safety. Let's threaten war. Let's threaten to come and to stir up trouble and to fight against Jerusalem. And maybe in that way, we will uh, persuade them to stop working, to stop the rebuild. This is the, if I don't get my way, right, I'm going to stop doing certain things. This is the like, if you don't stop, I'm going to make you stop. This is the, we're going to make sure we get our way at all costs kind of opposition. 
And what happens? Again, we prayed. Nehemiah says, we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people of Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. At this point, this is like a crucial moment in this sort of progression of opposition and these back and forth, because the people seeing the opposition, hearing the threats, become discouraged. And probably rightly so. Why wouldn't they? The reality is that opposition is discouraging. It it does diminish your resolve to do the things you've set out to do. It does beat you down. It does put you into a, a place where you just say, finally, like, fine. Like, why would I? Why should I? And that's exactly what this kind of opposition wants. It wants to say, hey, I couldn't ridicule you, but now maybe I can threaten you. So there's a threat, and then Nehemiah prays, and then he posts a guard. So what we see happen eventually is that from that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. Essentially, Nehemiah says, okay, there's a threat Let's pray, let's remind ourselves of of who is on our side, of why we are doing this, of, you know, who the God is who called us to this moment, and then let's take a practical step and let's put half of our people with, uh, you know, spears, shields, bows, and armor. They can stand guard and half of our people can build. What we actually find out is uh, a little bit later on at night, they like, they switch. And so they just go back and forth, standing guard and working and standing guard and working. Eventually, if you don't have a response to the opposition, you will become discouraged. And so Nehemiah prays, and then he responds. I remember doing a funeral one year um, that was positioned to uh, be, I mean, how I would would put confrontational. We expected it to be challenging. And uh, so we gathered a group of people before this funeral, said, hey, would you come and be in the building for the funeral? And, and don't attend, don't sit in the sanctuary, but would you sit off in a side room and would you pray for the entire thing? And so a group of people, they did, they were great. They arrived, and before the service, they were praying, and through the service, they were praying, and then after the service, they were praying. Until that building was empty, they were the last to leave because they were praying. They were standing guard while others were leading the service. And I remember that image, and that image has stuck with me, because in many ways, I think that that image is a modern version of what Nehemiah steps into in these verses. It is to say, hey, not all of us can do this particular work. All of us together need to commit to the task being done. Some of us might need to stand guard. And so for us as a church, there's probably nobody, like, threatening to uh, to to break down our doors. <laughs> There's probably nobody threatening your walls that you're building around your house. There's probably nobody threatening to come and, you know, give this sort of direct threat confrontation type opposition to you in the way that Nehemiah faced it. But what would it look like for us to commit in prayer to stand guard while the work of the church is being done? What would it look like in your life, in your family's life, to have other people praying for you as you are raising your kids? What would it look like to go out and say, hey, we are coming into a very difficult season of life. Would you pray specifically for us? What does it look like for us to have people standing guard in prayer? The second lesson is that prayer guards against discouragement. That prayer guards your heart against being discouraged, against being so discouraged that you give up. Back and forth. Prayer guards against discouragement. The final round of opposition that we're going to look at today starts in uh, chapter 6. And I'm not going to read all of it, but essentially what happens is that in chapter 6, the build kind of comes to its completion. The wall is completed. It reaches its target height. And Sanballat and all his buddies, they get together and they hear that that has happened. They hear that the wall is is built 
and uh, that there's no gaps in it. They hear that it is, um, you know, basically reaching its completion, and they get together to scheme against Nehemiah. And so, essentially, the progression is this. We haven't gotten him by, like, ridicule. We haven't gotten him by direct threat and confrontation. How are we going to get him? Like, you know, what's the last step of the opposition? And this is what they do. They send a letter to Nehemiah. And this is the contents of that letter. It says, it is reported, this is that group, Sambala and the others, to Nehemiah. It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it's true. It might as well be true. You know Geshem, right? Like, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt and therefore are building the wall. Moreover, according to these re reports, you are about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king. Pay attention, right? Now this report will get back to the king, so come and let us meet together. So, uh, you know, obviously they have no uh, ulterior motives, right? Like they've got, like they're not scheming anything. <laughs> what they're trying to do, they're trying to lure Nehemiah out. They're trying to get him out to come and meet with him. And they say this is how they do it. They try to blackmail him, right? They try to convince him, hey, you know, this is what we hear about you. This is what people are saying behind your back. Aren't you afraid that the king is going to find out what you're doing? There's a king in Judah, right? Now the king is, uh, will report back to the king. So come and let us meet together. Let me know if this sounds familiar to you. The ridicule doesn't work. Neither does the direct threat. So finally, uh, we've got slander and fear. They go after Nehemiah's character. When they can't get at him, like, directly, they go after him indirectly. They can't intimidate the builders. If they can't convince people to stop following Nehemiah, then maybe they could discredit Nehemiah's character. And so in doing, right, make him so afraid that he gives up. And again, we see Nehemiah pray. It says, I sent this reply. Uh, this is a great example of, like, non-anxious leadership. Uh, nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. Um, again, like Nehemiah gets a, little, <laughs> he gets a little salty with them. They were all trying to frighten us, but he says, listen, I, I see what they're doing. They're just trying to, f to make us afraid, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed, but I prayed, now strengthen my hands. The strength that Nehemiah prays for in the moments. I don't think is just the strength to put one stone on top of another, right? The, the, the build is done. It's not the physical strength to complete the work. It is the mental fortitude to continue moving in the direction that they believe they are called to go, the way in which God has called them. When Nehemiah is doing, he's praying, listen, God, would you strengthen my hands? Would you strengthen me and us for the task that you have ahead of us? And I think, again, for us, prayer has this way, when we face opposition, of guarding us against this type of fear, right? To guard against a fear that would, that would intimidate, to guard against a fear that would just convince us, hey, this is not worth doing, to guard against a fear that would cause us to stop working in a particular direction. And prayer also gives us strength to continue forward in the direction that God has called us. Last point for us today. We all have the ability to participate in both sides of opposition, right? We can't always assume that we are the opposed. It's easy to want to read ourselves into the place and position of Nehemiah and those who are rebuilding the wall. I mean, like, that's how I set up this entire sermon series, is that we are equally in a season of rebuilding. But we've got to always keep ourselves open to the possibility and aware of the possibility that you can experience opposition, yes, but you can also oppose you can be the one opposing the bill. The final thing that I want to suggest for us today is that prayer offers uh, a way to keep us humble. 
Prayer is the only thing that is going to keep us in line with the vision of what God wants for the church in the world. Prayer is the thing that is going to keep our hearts and our minds fixed in the right direction. Prayer is the thing that is going to keep us in a position of saying, God, what would you have me do, not what do I want to do? Am I working in line with what God is doing, or am I opposing what God is doing? And so prayer guards against defensiveness. Prayer guards against discouragement. Prayer guards against fear and gives you strength. And finally, prayer keeps you humble. 